also be able to see that in the center of the northern area is a relatively bright area. And what that shows you is that there's spatial variability. Some areas have a stronger signature than other areas. And we'll be coming back to that uh, 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 through the discussion. So there's two take-home uh, messages here. One, M cubed detects it at high latitudes. And two, there's spatial variability. And that one area that you see in the northern part is a large crater called Goldschmidt. So we see it at large craters. Let's go to my next chart. Um, in addition to the large chart, now we're go all the previous data I'd shown you are we've taken our data and downsampled it 100 times to fit onto one globe. When you look at the individual measurements, you see a lot more detail. And this particular strip is 40 kilometers in diameter. Um, and looking at very, very small, tiny, fresh impact craters, we see this signature shown over on the right, this downturn into the diagnostic properties, absorption properties of water. And what we're showing here is that even at small craters, the size of Meteor Crater, for example, in Arizona, you get this detection of, uh, of a strong signal. Now, also shown there, perhaps less clear in the back of the room, is the background uh, area seen in this moon, which does not have this signature. So the spatial variability is very important. OK, let's go on to the next chart. Um, um, and what this shows is a variety of hypotheses that we and the various team members have been discussing of how, what physical form this water may occur on the surface. We do not know uh, precisely. We have several hypotheses. We need, of course, more data. But there's a lot of suggestions, in fact, a, a, one that we have a, a firm consensus on, that what we're seeing occurs in the uppermost surface of the moon, of the lunar soil, upper two millimeters. And these are a variety of different ways that could occur. It could occur as one monolayer, where these are just a few molecules thick. It could be mixed into the soil. It could be altered minerals on the surface. There could be various gradients within the upper few millimeters. These are areas that we'll be actively pursuing in the years ahead. And with that introduction, let me turn it over to Rob Green. Thank you, Carly. I'd like to provide at this point a little bit more background on the M-cubed uh, science mission and how we've come here. Uh, M-cubed was designed and proposed to measure the composition of the moon. You're seeing that here in this graphic. We know the moon consists of rocks, and rocks contain minerals. On the upper right, I've got a picture of a rock that was returned by the Apollo 15 mission. The minerals in the rocks interact with light differently at different wavelengths. And in the middle, you're seeing spectral signatures. So this is the way those minerals interact with the light through wavelength. And they give us signatures for us to decide what the composition of the surface of the moon is based on these measurements. So we needed an instrument that could measure the surface of the moon. And for every point in the images acquired, we have a spectrum to get the signature to determine the composition. Could I have the next graphic, please? And this is a depiction of the type of instrument we've used with M-cubed to achieve these uh, amazing results. From this graphic, you can see white light is reflected from the moon into a telescope of our instrument. From that telescope, the light is passed into a spectrometer. We break the natural light into the rainbow, into the spectrum, and then record that spectrum for each point in the image, producing an image cube which contains a spectral signature for each point in the image from which we can determine the composition of the surface. Next graphic, please. And this is the instrument, a very special instrument, uh, the M-cubed, uh, developed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here we are in the clean room uh, during the development process. This gives you an idea of its size. Carly Peters, uh, the principal scientist, is there with her handout uh, looking at the instrument during the alignment uh, phase. Just to give you a perspective, the instrument weighs about 20 pounds. It runs with the energy of a 20-watt light bulb and is about the size of a desktop laser printer uh, to give you a feel for what it is. And it's quite a compact little instrument for a very big job, which is to map the composition of the entire surface of Earth's moon. Could I have the, the next graphic, please? And now I'd like to show you some more of the spectacular results that have been returned by M-cubed. 
The image on the left is one of our very favorites. This is one of the first images that came back on the 19th of November 2008, which showed us on the Chandran 1 mission, we had a working instrument, and we were measuring exactly what we set out to measure, which were spectral image cubes, where we have an image, and then for every point of that image, we have a spectrum underlying it to uh, measure the composition of the surface of the moon. And you're seeing a representation of those spectra on the top and side rainbow panels. Um, so we were very excited to see this, this result um, on the 19th of November. I've included another image cube there. This is another uh, spectacular data set collected. This is the Apollo 15 landing site. And you can see the Hadley Rill there where the Apollo 15 landed uh, decades ago. And I want to summarize that we have, in fact, almost 1,000 gigabytes of data from m -cubed returned over 10 months, all of this type to allow us to, in fact, cover more than 90% of the moon. And you're just seeing the beginning of the results and some of the highlights from the early analysis of these data. So could I have the, the next graphic, please? So having shown you some of the data sets, now I'd like to show some of the mineral results from m -cubed. This is a map of aspects of the mineralogy of Earth's moon. Here you're seeing in greens, purples, and blues, iron-bearing minerals that we've been able to map because we have a spectral signature for every point in the image that we've collected. These would be iron minerals that would be similar to the basalt lavas that you might find in the Hawaiian volcanoes, for example. The red areas are areas that contain the mineral plagioclase. Again, plagioclase, we're measuring minerals. And these are, uh, plagioclase is a feldspar mineral, which is also found in earth rocks. It's a common rock-forming mineral. So just to give you a, an indication that we're also proceeding in addition to the amazing water discovery, we've also begun our primary mission of mapping the mineralogy of Earth's moon with these data. And now, before I go to the next slide, I'd like to invite you all tonight or over the next week, if it's clear, to go out and look at the moon as you've known it, I've known it, as a white or gray object in the sky, and to realize that with an imaging spectrometer, um, like m -cubed, like the other instruments we'll be talking about, really it's, the moon is much more than simply a gray body in orbit around the Earth. It is full of spectacular spectral variation. And this depiction should shift to a, a movie through the spectrum showing uh, the different colors that we've been able to derive. There you can start to see colors sweep through. This is a tour through the M-cubed data set collected so far showing the, the amazing compositional diversity. Uh, for all of those who thought the moon was gray, it isn't. It's full of spectacular spectral content, which we can relate to composition. We've talked a little bit about the water that we've discovered with these measurements and a little bit about the mineralogy. But we're going to know in the next decades much more about the moon thanks to these measurements. And with that, I'd like to pass it to Roger. OK, I'm going to talk about uh, the Cassini results and also more m cubed results. Cassini flew by uh, the Earth and got a view of the moon on, its, uh, on a gravity assist on its way to Saturn back in August of 1999. So it's been a long time. Um, may I have the first slide, please? The uh, basic results of the Cassini flyby of the moon are shown here in the top are just a, a normal uh, intensity view from the VIMS instrument and the imaging system. And in the bottom row are the derived results from the VIMS. Uh, the temperature in the middle is the map of the water. And on the uh, lower right is the map of the hydroxyl. Now, what's astounding about uh, these results is that the water and hydroxyl exists at all latitudes on the moon in direct sunlight, where it's uh, really quite hot. In fact, hotter at the equator than boiling water. So um, now the hydroxyl is um, uh, an OH uh, molecule or bond that uh, creates a chemical reaction with other minerals in the surface, and that will create hydroxyl-bearing minerals. We haven't identified the, any of the minerals yet, but uh, there's a wide variety of hydroxyl-bearing compounds. Clay minerals are an example of hydroxyl-bearing uh, minerals. Um, now, the diversity that we see here, there's variations in the intensity of the, uh, the water signature and the hydroxyl signature. That's telling us that there's some dynamic processes going on. The weathering and reactions going on are different on different places on the moon. Let's go to the next view graph where I'll uh, show you why this is a, a pretty difficult detection and why it takes three spacecraft to really 
uh, confirm it and make it a solid